Well, again, tonight for our uh, teaching time, we're going to be uh, you know, going to read Romans 5, 1 through 8. Now, uh, tonight's going to be our fourth um, uh, lesson about total depravity. And while the first three lessons have primarily been about the negative side of total depravity, not that there's a good side of total depravity, what we're going to talk about tonight is what the Lord does about total depravity, uh, how he fixes us who are totally depraved. And uh, to talk a little bit about that, we're going to go to uh, Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 uh, through 8. So join me there as we go uh, to that portion of God's word. Again, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 uh, through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Now, you know, the fifth chapter of the book of Romans is kind of the culmination of everything that Paul has been talking about in the first half, or the first part of the book of Romans, right? Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3 are all about sin and all about the judgment of God for sin where sin comes from, who's a sinner, and what sin does to us. And in chapter 4, we heard a little bit from the Old Testament uh, about Abraham and David. What made them righteous? Right? The righteousness that comes by faith. And in chapter 5, we're told where faith comes from. Because we need to remember something about the nature of how God deals with our wickedness. You know, the first thing that we're told here in Romans 5 is that we have been justified by faith. And being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And that's the, that's the good preacher answer. Right? If, a, if a preacher ever asks you a question, what, what, what should be your first uh, response? Jesus, right? Because there's a good chance that's the answer, right? It's kind of, I, I haven't done any of the wordle stuff, uh, primarily because I barely can speak English, let alone <laughs> guess a bunch of words, but my mom has been heavily invested in it, and you know, she's been trying to explain to me how that all works, and it doesn't make any sense to me, but um, the whole concept, right, of what we see happening here is the... Uh, nature again of defining what words mean and understanding what words mean. And when we think of the word faith, right, we need to understand that faith is not something that we present to God out of our own heart. That faith itself is what? A gift, right? That it's a gift from above. And we hear that here in the fact that our, uh, our faith, you know, being a gift from God, we hear in verse 6 that when we were still without strength, okay, so, so what do you think that means, that we were still without strength? We're babes, right? We aren't able to do for ourselves. Right. We, we are, it's needful for us to be weighted on hand and foot. Right? We're not able to do that for ourselves. So when we were still without strength, we're told in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, that language of due time 
is a shorthand way of saying everything that happened from Adam's fall until the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, you know, Paul has to explain something about that. Because just using kind of basic logic, what sense does it make to die for an ungodly person? Right? Paul says, you know, you know, for a righteous man, someone will die. Right? I mean, you, know, you think about that, right? That makes sense. You know, it, you know, you, you know, let, let's use the imagery of a child again, right? If, if you have to choose between saving life and a child or giving up your own life, what, what decision are you going to make? Right? Two, you're going to save the child. Why? It's a child. It's a child, right? Yeah, we assign innocence to children. Now, of course, what, what do we believe? What do we, what's the Bible teach about children? <laughs> they're not innocent, right? That they're sinners like everybody else. But that's not really the point that Paul's trying to make here, right? He, he's saying, like, look, right, to the natural man's mind, it makes sense that you would sacrifice yourself for a righteous man or even a good man. Some would even dare to die. But the amazing thing about salvation is that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. You know, we see this uh, marked out in John's first epistle where it says as about as clear as it can, we love God because why? He first loved us. Because he first loved us. All right? you know, and that, that is so important to understand about the nature of faith. Right? We are not regenerated when we come to faith. Right? It, it's not as if you know, we make the step and say, I believe in Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit comes and washes away our sins. All right? It's the other way around. Right? Have you ever heard the expression, getting the cart before the horse? Uh, you know, what does that mean? It's, wrong <laughs> it's in the wrong order, right? If, if you tried to tie the horse up to the back of the cart, uh, what would happen? <laughs> Nothing, right? You just have a mad horse, probably. Right? Because uh, the horse has been bred to do what? Pull the cart, right? So if the horse is on the wrong side, it knows that it's doing something wrong. And it gets frustrated and all that kind of stuff. Well, you, you put the horse first. That way the cart can move forward. And the same thing's true of our salvation, right? Regeneration precedes faith, right? Our being made new creatures in Christ comes before our ability to profess faith in Jesus Christ. Because again, we are ungodly, we are sinners, and we're dead in sin. And so then, you know, when we ask that question, how does God deal with our wickedness? Well, we see that God deals with our wickedness by sending the Lord Jesus Christ to lay down his life for our sins. Now, another place we see uh, this explained is in the book of Galatians in chapter 4, uh, verse 4, where it said, but says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, you, again, define things. You know, come to understand what something says. So again, just like in Romans 5 where it says, in due time, here Paul says, in the fullness of the time. Which basically means that from before the foundation of the world, God had declared that Jesus Christ would die for the sins of his people on the cross at Calvary on Golgotha. And it was a set time that would come in history. And there was nothing that human beings could do to rush it up or to push it back. Right? This was going to happen and it was part of God's decree, part of his purpose, part of his plan. And so when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, right? Jesus Christ, the son of God. And we're told that he is born of a woman, right? Now, how is he born of a woman? Right? In the ordinary way, right? It's not as if, you know, Jesus is delivered by postal, 
right? He is born of a virgin in of the of Mary in Bethlehem in uh, the city of David, as had been prophesied, and we're told that he's born of a woman and he's born under the law. Now, whenever we see the law mentioned in the Bible, we are told again that there are different definitions that we see. All right? Sometimes when we see law, it means the Ten Commandments. Sometimes we're told law, it means the Old Testament in general. Sometimes it means the five books of Moses. You know, you'll see it like the law and the prophets, right? The law is the five books of Moses and the prophets is everything that comes from Joshua to Malachi. And what is meant here is the law of Moses, okay? Is meant the ceremonial law. And we are also to understand what is meant here is the uh, law, the covenant of works that was broken by Adam. So he's born under the law. And being born under the law, what was he, what was the purpose of that? Well, the next verse, verse 5, tells us it says, to redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive the adoption as sons. You know, the reality is, is that we are under the law because we are united to Adam, right? Adam is our federal head. He is the head of the covenant of works. And so Jesus, in order to save us, had to be born under the law, had to be born under the rubric of the covenant, not just as he was as God, right? Because Jesus was a part of the covenant as, you know, one of the members of the Trinity, but had the Trinity broken the covenant? No, right? So the Trinity had no need to fix what was wrong with the covenant, right? You know, you know, I don't know how many of y'all have experience with having renters, um, but uh, uh, my dad uh, rented out our houses various times in life, and more than once I had, I had to go with him to, um, uh, to uh, uh, remove tenants <laughs> from those places. And, you know, the reality was is that we weren't there because my dad broke the covenant, Right. We were there because whoever was staying there had not fulfilled their side of the covenant. Now, who had to do the work? <laughs> we did, right? And it was a lot of work most of the time to get that done. Well, Jesus, again, in, as being born under a woman, being born under the law, is coming to do the work to fix the broken covenant, the covenant of of works, And he had to be born in a natural way from a human being in order for that to be accomplished. And so to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, it's another reason why Jesus had to be born of a woman and under the law. Because again, the only way that we could be translated or adopted into God's family is if we were declared members of God's family, right? You know, I don't know if any of y'all have had the blessing of being in a courtroom watching the adoption process take place, but it's, just, it's an amazing thing to witness. You know, where you have, you know, a, you know attorneys on either docks, you know, one representing the state and one representing the family. And at some point in time during the proceedings, the judge will declare that this child is no longer the uh, under the authority of their biological parents, uh, that, but are now under the authority of their adopted parents. And one of the things that he says in that is he, uh, you know, names the child and gives them their new identity, right? Their new, uh, you know, their, their new last name, right? That's all part of that process. And the idea here is, is that they have become as natural sons and daughters to that new family, right? They have all the, the, uh, all the rights and privileges which come from natural, uh, you know, children, right? There's no legal difference in the eyes of the state between an adopted child 
and a biological child. And that's true of our salvation, right? Because we are of our father, the devil, right? We are of our father, um, you know, Adam. And what takes place, one of the things that takes place in our redemption is that our family name changes, right? We go from being under the uh, authority of the devil to being under the authority of the living and the true God. And we receive all the benefits of it. In fact, we hear here in Galatians 4 that we are no longer a slave, but a son. And of a son, an heir of God through Christ. It's one of the reasons why we can call Jesus our brother. Because he is. Jesus may be the, you know, again, we have to be careful sometimes about how we use this language. right? Jesus is the son of God, and so are we. Now, we're not some God in the same way Jesus is, right? But we are, we have all the rights and privileges that Jesus has as a son or daughter of the living God. And so what we see in this is how God deals with our wickedness, right? The, the, our heavenly father, right, who, who sees us as ungodly, as wicked, as evil, has done what? He has loved us. He has loved us enough to send his only begotten son to die for us, to lay down his life for sinners. Right? We don't have to do anything to dress ourselves up for adoption. Right? We are filthy. We are in every way unworthy of such a gift. But it wouldn't be much of a gift, right, if we earned our way into the house. It is only by the grace and love of God that this uh, takes place. And the reason why we need to spend so much time on this and think about this is because of how amazing it is, of how just unreal it is to consider that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, right? Because it makes sense that he laid down his life for a righteous man or a good man. But who has he laid down his life for? Sinners like us. Sinners like us. And that, again, is the great motivator towards obedience, towards worship, right? and towards everything that makes us who we are. And you know, that, that's part of why it's important for us to be reminded of our own sin and, and reminded of uh, exactly what the Lord has done uh, for us. We'll go ahead and close on that. But any questions or, or comments or anything? All right, well, let's go ahead and, and uh, close uh, in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for uh, the grace that you have bestowed upon us, for the way that your Holy Spirit has guided us, has strengthened us, and reminded us of what it means to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and how wonderful it is to consider exactly what has taken place in our salvation. And dear God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would, would assist us in uh, recognizing these truths, but most of all, dear God, uh, that we would be moved to worship and give, and give thanks unto you each day uh, for your grace. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our benediction today comes from uh, John uh, 3.16. So let me go ahead and turn there and we'll uh, close tonight. Hear the benediction today from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Amen.